Welcome to the Changemakers podcast produced by City Current, powered by Higginbotham. I'm your host, Jeremy Park, and we are in for a treat when you talk about HGTV, finding your purpose, so much more to unpack. We're honored to have with us Tracy Schubert Barrett, sought after international speaker, best selling author of What If There's More, Finding Significance Beyond Success, and the founder of Navigate the Journey, a leading business business consulting and leadership development firm, which we'll talk all about. But Tracy, how are you doing? Great, great. It's so fun to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We've had you on our radio and TV shows talking a little bit about Navigate the Journey, but this is a fun chance for us to get to know you better, talk about your own personal journey, talk about HGTV and the lessons learned there and how all of that is positioning between online classes and you know, talk about discovering your significance and your purpose. There's a lot to dive into, but let's go ahead and start. Give us a little bit when you talk about your childhood, talk about where you grew up. Yeah, I grew up in South Florida in West Palm Beach and spent, you know, the first 18 years of my life there. Give us an idea of family. So when you talk about mother, father, what do they do? Any brothers and sisters? Give us some family perspective. Yeah. So I'm the third of four kids. I have older brother, older sister, younger sister. And um, mom and dad, you know, they were, you know, just very strong influences on my life. My dad uh, was an electrician and so very hard worker. And just, I saw his work ethic as just, it had a, a, a huge impact on me. He loved what he did. He really did. And I think that played a big part in, you know, your perspective on work and, and how you view work and, and being grateful for work and also, you know, living in a way that, you know, matches your means and, and really making sure, um, you know, that you live within your means. He was a big advocate for that, but he also was a man of just both my parents of strong Christian faith. And, you know, so I was raised in a very, um, centered, tethered, faith-filled environment. So, um, you're looking back, just so grateful for that. So grateful to have, you know, a safe place where I could, you know, explore my faith, grow in my faith, but, and also be supported in whatever it is that, you know, I wanted to do. And, and I think, you know, my, my dad was a big advocate for me. He saw a lot in me before I saw what was in me, if that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. What, when you look at that time period, what were your goals? What, you know, what, what were your big dreams then? Yeah. You know, I, I was thinking about this just the other day of kind of this pivot point in my life that, you know, in my younger years, I, I tended to be a little bit more introverted and more of an observer, but I was so drawn to music and arts. And so I sang at a very young age, you know, I would get on stage and I had no stage fright. I've never had any stage fright. It's the weirdest thing. So I will get on stage and, you know, whether it was in theater or whether it was singing or musical theater or, you know, that that was a safe space for me. I liked being on stage and I love the experience of, you know, either portraying a song or portraying a character or any of those things. But when I came off stage, I was a little bit more shy. It was weird. And in my freshman year of high school, a teacher recommended that I should do speech and debate. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. And our high school had one of the top speech and debate teams in the country. And I joined and excelled in it. And by far one of the biggest pivot points of my life, I think really being able to, to perform in that way, it gave me a new sense of myself, a new confidence. Um, my parents really supported it. And I just found kind of my voice through that. And I think it just put me on a different trajectory. Pretty cool that that came from a teacher too, saying, hey, mm -hmm. what about this? Seeing something in you, you know, and saying, hey, let's go in this direction. And obviously how that helped change the course. Oh, What's yeah. a tradition when you think back with your family, something that, you know, stands out to you, it could be around the holidays or just, you know, the dinner table or church, but what, what's a tradition that stands out looking back? Well, looking back, I always think about the fact that my mother is a as a first generation Portuguese 
uh, my my grandparents are from Portugal, um, from the Azores specifically. And so we had this huge, she's one of seven children. A lot of her siblings had seven, you know, five, seven kids. So we would have these huge family reunions. And my grandmother was sort of, you know, kind of the matriarch of the whole thing. And it was such a fun time to, to go to those um, reunions and to just the amount of hugging and kissing and food and loudness and craziness. And I think looking back, I just think it instilled in me this sense of always wanting to, to be around a lot of people and have fun and have families. Like the more people we can put around the Thanksgiving table, the better I feel. Like, I just am like, let's laugh and have fun. And, you know, you invite your friends and it doesn't matter if I'm related to you. I've never met you. I want you at the Thanksgiving table. And so I think that just comes from just really loving the environment of being around all these sort of just, you know, true blue Portuguese loving, you know, people. Talk about college and that path. So obviously you start heading in communications, debate, you know, some of those pieces. You've got obviously the stage and being, you know, enjoying being on stage. But talk about your college experience. Yeah. So I really wanted to go to college. My my dad kept saying you should be on television, you know, from just from watching me on speech and debate and all of that. And I there was something. I don't know if it was because my parents watched the Today Show a lot, you know, or you're looking at, you know, Jane Pauley or Katie Couric or whatever. I was like, ooh, that would be so fun. So I just got into my head. I just wanted to be on television. That's what I was going to do. And I was the first one in our family to go to college. And so my parents hadn't gone to college. My older brother and sister didn't go to college. And so I decided I really wanted to go to college. And I think that was something kind of new and exciting for our family. And what was this going to be like? I didn't have a lot of information, you know, so I was dependent on my guidance counselors and all of that school. But I thought it would be a great idea to go to Indiana University because that's where Jane Pauley went. <laughs> so I wanted to get into television. And, you know, they have a great business school, Kelly School of Business. And so I'm like, I'm going to, you know, do the media school, do the business school, went to Indiana, which was 2000 miles away from home. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. So it was, well, you're going to go, but we can only bring you home at Christmas. And, you know, you're going to have to work to make this possible. And, and so I went to Indiana, I got a job actually working in the, in the media school, and I was placed under the Dean as his kind of assistant. And that was another pivot point in my life as somebody who just really took an interest in me, really coached me as far as like television's concerned and what some of the options were. He just recently passed away. And um, yeah, I just look back on him fondly. And then um, exiting college, I was like either going to go into the newsroom or, you know, something else. And so I did an internship in a newsroom and that quickly changed my mind. <laughs> it was like... I interviewed the anchors and I was a reporter and just it, it wasn't exactly a perfect fit for me, you know, doing reporting, you have to move all over the country. And in most of the time you're waiting for the story to happen. And um, I realized I was drawn more to being behind the scenes than in front of the camera. And so um, this was at the dawn of cable television. I really, you know, which is much like how a lot of people feel about the internet today. You know, we can all remember sort of the birth of the internet and internet companies and how all the startups were there and that was big. That's how cable television was. It was like, you know, the early mid nineties, everybody thought cable television was revolutionary. No, we're not going to have four networks anymore. We're actually going to have a hundred channels. How is that possible? What are they going to all be about? You know, so it was this really exciting time. And I think I always had this entrepreneurial spirit about me. And, you know, when I was a kid, I started a little cleaning business and I would go to church and I'd hand out the card, the business cards I had literally written on a piece of paper. I'll come over and clean your house for 10 bucks or whatever. And, you know, my parents were like, oh, she's got another business. She's got another business. So it was just ingrained in me. And I'm sure, again, from watching my father and his business, I just, you know, really felt like this inter entrepreneurial bug in me. And so 
cable television, it reignited that like, oh, what would it be like to be part of a startup or to really get into the ground level? And I was interv interviewing at some bigger cable networks and um, somebody just mentioned at one of the interviews, you know, um, we don't have any openings here, but they're starting this network and I don't know what it's going to be called, but I know it's like home shows or something like that and I'll connect you. And so by the time I got home from work that day, there was a message on my answering machine back when we had answering machines and, um, and there it was an uh, opportunity to interview at HGTV or what was going to become HGTV. So hold that thought. Cause I want to go back and it'll, it'll tie back into this okay. one. I'm curious because when you look back at the college experience and especially with the, the mentorship from the Dean, mm. was that something that you drove? So in other words, you know, we talked to a lot of college students and we talk about how, you know, you have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone and create success. Mm -hmm. It's not just going to fall in your lap. And so while there are some who will say, Hey, I see something in you and let's go this direction. Many cases it's like, Hey, I, I want to do this. I want to do this. Can you help me? So did you drive that? Did they drive that? Was it 50-50? You know, talk about you as a student, how that mentorship evolved. Yeah, I am such, I don't know what it is in me or, or how it happened, but I am drawn to mentors. I'm drawn to seeking mentors. I, I know that the success I've had in life would have not happened if not for my mentors, you know, people speaking into my life, people believing in me, people helping pave the way for me. It just wouldn't have happened. And I think one of the gifts, um, and it, I know it's, it sounds a little weird to say it was a gift, but going into college and needing finances, you know, instead of going into college and and having everything paid for or, you know, not needing to work or whatever. I I needed to get a job. And I think, you know, doing part of like what was called work study and where you would work and in, in the college and, and the funds would go directly to your admissions cost. That was a gift because it wouldn't, I wouldn't have been in that situation. You know, I wouldn't have been working there. And a lot of my friends didn't work, didn't have a job, you know, or they were just doing something like waitressing or whatever, but to have this unique experience where I was plugged in to the school and able to, you know, have quiet moments where I could approach a Dean or a professor or somebody that was a senior when I was a freshman and just say, Hey, you know, how does this work? Or what do you think of this class? Or how did you get to where you are today? Or do you know this person in the industry? Just in, you know, delivering papers to a desk or, you know, I was doing very menial tasks, but but I would it was providing me with that opportunity to connect. And so I, even as I talked to my own daughters who are, one's a junior and one's a senior in high school, all we're talking about is college right now. And I keep saying to them, like, look, I want you to do this. I want you to work. I want you to find ways to connect with. I don't care how big your school is. You know, my school was huge. But then I had these small connections, you know, close connections with people that I wouldn't have gotten just sitting in a classroom. So, yeah, I agree with you. Like what you're saying to college students is is key. Well, and then it carries over into the conversation around HGTV. It's life is about relationships mm -hmm. and you going and creating those or those, you know, being created. But in, in essence, everything is about relationships and building trust. Yeah. So obviously in that moment where they didn't have an immediate opening, but someone saying, Hey, I see potential in you. I trust you. I think you're a great fit. Let me open the door for HGTV. So what what in that moment of building that relationship do you think led them to open that door to put themselves on the line to open the door for HGTV for you? Yeah, you know, when you get out of college, one thing you learn pretty quickly is it's all about who you know, and it's all about networking. And I guess that's true in the business world as well. But it was a sorority sister that had actually connected me to this woman. And it was actually an interview at MTV. And um, MTV at the time was, you know, all the rage. It was one of the, you know, there was only a handful of cable networks around at that time. You know, CNN, Ted Turner had was prolific in that space. And then you had MTV and, and Discovery Channel. But beyond that, there wasn't much. And so to be, you know, in that environment and be talking to somebody at that level, I think 
what she saw in me is that I really understood what cable television was trying to do. And I wanted to be a part of it. Like I just, I didn't care how or what, like I just wanted to be a part of it. And I, at the time I was just working, um, you know, in local television. And, and so it was, you know, very standard broadcast television and I was kind of bored and I was, I was honest with her. I said, you know, I, I really feel bored. I want to be challenged. I also want to make sure this is the industry for me right now. If I continue into broadcast, I'm, I'm not sure that's the environment I want to be in. I want to be in something like this, more exciting, more forward thinking, evolving. There's, you know, space. And I think that connected with her was like, oh, you're not here just because you want to work at MTV or you want to, you know, you actually are thinking beyond the name of the network and you actually are thinking about the industry as a whole. And I think that really connected with her. And then she was like, all right, if you really want to be in this industry, let's get you in with a startup, you know, something that's not even on air yet. And I think a lot of this, the soul searching, understanding yourself, the situation, building the relationships, all of this ties into navigating the journey. Mm -hmm. So we navigate the journey and finding your significance and some of these, like, this is the personal storyline that you yourself have been navigating. Yes. And so it leads into, you know, the, the conversation around how you're helping others. And so go ahead and carry then the HGTV conversation forward. Talk about obviously stepping in and literally helping to create this whole new opportunity. Yeah, it was a wild ride. And it was one of those rides you weren't sure if it was going to work or not work, much like any startup, you know, anybody who goes into a startup situation, whether you're starting it yourself or with a group of people, it's always a question mark, right? And I think what was super compelling to me when I interviewed for the job was the vision that the founder had. Like it was very clear. He also believed in the promise of cable television. He believed like, look, we we want to stay true. We want to provide 24 hours of just home and garden programming. And that's going to be hard because there's not a lot out there. So we're going to have to produce a lot and, and we're going to have to buy a lot from producers and put this together. And we don't have a huge company backing us like a Ted Turner with endless amounts of cash or a broadcast arm that's going to help us with distribution. We are going to have to be scrappy. We're going to have to get out there, find distribution, find advertising dollars to fund us so that we can actually make programs. And so all of that sounded super exciting to me. And I loved kind of the mission and the vision and the fact that, you know, we as a small group wanted to have core values. And this is back in 94, you know, before core values were all the rage and everybody was talking the, about it. And this was also pre internet. So we're talking about getting something out there without the arm of the internet, of the reach of the internet, you know? So we're, we're, we're talking like grassroots hit in the ground, get, you know, telling people about it, trying to get distribution. And so all of that was really compelling to me. And I think exciting, but we all knew it was just a small group of us that, you know, that started it in the beginning and, and we could fit all in one room and we would all have the same conversations about how exciting it was, but also how there were so many other networks that were launching and failing. And so you would see the list. I remembered this list would come across um, the facts and it would say, you know, networks launching and dates that they were launching. And, and I, you know, the vast majority of them don't exist, you know, today. And so we knew the reality was clear. We could succeed or we could fail. And it was like a 50, 50 chance. And so I think it was really staying true to who we are, not wavering from our mission, having a very clear vision, um, really having strong core values. What, you know, we were based in Knoxville, Tennessee, which was highly unusual because most networks are based in New York City or LA. And that was kind of a fun story how that came to be. And a lot of that had to do with, you know, production and finances and just trying to stay scrappy and 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 really affordable. But I do think, and I know now I was in Chicago for 25 years and just recently moved to Nashville, but there is something about Tennessee, this just, you know, people were very um, thoughtful and genuine. And and I think, you know, the the people who came together and started 
were all from all over. I mean, we had recruited people from big, huge networks, tons of great experiences. They were moving to this small town in Tennessee from New York and Chicago and LA. And it was, they were like, what's happening? But it did give this like almost a slower pace that allowed people to be very thoughtful and, you know, the space to create and to really, and I, I feel like, I don't know if you feel the same way, but when you look at HGTV, especially in the, the, you know, the first 20 years of its existence, it kind of had that feel like you could kind of tell it wasn't this like slick, you know, produced in a big, you know, and there, and we stayed true to that. Every show has a happy ending and, you know, and it's going to be, con- we're going to be connected. And so I kind of feel like that came through on air. Or at least my hope is that that came through on air. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's, Interesting because like you mentioned, you know, having to get the voicemail off a machine and not having social media where now you scroll through like Instagram and you see all the home tours and things like none of that existed. And so mm-hmm. building all that organically and, and through scratch. And I, and I remember too, on the last interview we did with the TV and radio, you were talking about kind of, you know, the moment where it, it flipped, where it's like, wow, this is reality. People are coming to me talking about HGTV. Like we've, we've made it. We're, we're yes. Yes. Um, but share, you know, I think in many cases, you only see the success. You don't see the sacrifices. Mm. Was there a specific or, you know, just in general, um, you know, a moment of sacrifice, whether it's, you know, taking a pay cut to make it work or, you know, having to to be creative over here to make the finances work, you know, share kind of a challenge that made you stronger in the process that maybe you look on now and say, wow, in that moment, it was difficult, but now it really has helped shape who I am today. Yeah, I think the the biggest sacrifice, you know, yeah, we all started out as not well paid <laughs> television executives and then became well paid. And in that beginning stages, you have to have a lot of belief in what you're doing and you really at least if you're going to to last the long run and you know, it took a good 5 years before, you know, we got to that point where people weren't like, "Wait, what what do you work who do you work for? I don't understand what you're saying, you know, and you're, it's this long explanation. And, but I was part of my job was to go out and get the funding, get the advertising dollars. And so the amount, the sheer amount of rejection in those first couple of years was rough. You know, you're going into huge companies, big agencies, and you're trying to pitch something that at, you know, either doesn't exist or it's only been on the air for a few, few um, months and, and none of them have it. So you're putting in a VHS tape and you're kind of showing them something on the TV and you're like, here's an example of it, you know, and it was really, really hard. I, I, it was hard. And, and I built up a thick skin, you know, of the rejection and and people saying things like, this is never going to work. It's never going to work. Like I, you know, good luck to you guys, you know, are very condescending or very demeaning or, um, and so when you're starting a business and you're starting something, you know, having belief in it and having perseverance and having grit is, is so important because, you know, I was reading an article. I was actually sharing this with my oldest daughter because she wants to get into entrepreneurship. Poor thing, she, like she's like <laughs> the the gene is in her, you know. And um, she's talking about you know where's a good entrepreneurship you know program for school that you know looking at colleges. And I read her this article um, about Sarah Blakely and Spanx and and her saying how many women came up to her and said you know, I had that idea too. Like I've cut the, you know, the pantyhose off to create that for myself. Like why didn't I, you know, become you, the bill, you know, the most famous uh, female billionaire in history, right? Youngest female billionaire in history. And she said, you know, there are a lot of great ideas out there. It's not the idea. It's the perseverance. It's the grit. That's really going to make it come to life and be successful because there were a lot of television networks that and cable networks that wanted to launch and they didn't come to an exi- to existence or they don't exist today. And it probably wasn't because it was the worst idea. 
probably some of them were brilliant ideas, but the perseverance, the pushing through, um, because it was, it wasn't easy, you know, it was, I loved the people I worked with, but those are some very lonely moments when you're sitting at a desk in a big high rise in the middle of a huge city and people are telling you you're crazy. So give us one special moment in terms of like, you know, meeting someone, a show, a project that you had a chance to work on. What's, what's a moment that really puts a smile on your face for you personally? There's so many that I feel like my mind is being flooded with all these like key moments, but I remember, you know, we did dream HGTV dream home giveaway, which happens every year. And the executives would fly to give the home away for to the person who would win. And we would bring the advertisers that sponsored it. And it was, it was a, definitely a perk of being one of the executives to get to go every single year to these trips. And so I can remember, you know, some of those first ones where you would walk into the home and it was the most spectacular thing you would, could ever see just impeccably designed. And then to watch the winners come in. And I can remember walking um, a couple through that had won. And I was like, like this bowl is yours now. Like this flower arrangement is yours now. And they were just so excited. And it was such a fun thing. And I remember in that moment, it was like with television, it's weird because you're projecting something out there and you're not sure, you know, you know, there's fans and you know, people love it and all of that. But it, when you have this sort of one-on-one -on -one moment with a viewer and it's kind of like the moment when you hear a customer or a client say, you really, really helped me or whatever. So those moments when you're working in a big television industry are far and few between, but they were just beautiful. Mo Every dream home, I just have the most wonderful memories of seeing real life fans connecting with something so tangible, you know? So those moments really stick out to me. The moments where we were able to connect with the viewers and really able to see, because it's hard to make sense of television. I know this is really, and I, because I coach so many people in corporate America, I know it can be hard to make sense of the meaning behind your work. Like, am I just putting television out there? Or like advertising isn't even really great for people. You know, you just start to feel like, is this like what I'm supposed to be doing? And and so, you know, sometimes you really have to like change your perspective to find the meaning behind what the big mammoth thing is that you're doing. And so I tried to get better at finding those moments, you know, of connection. Well, and I like that your, you know, the, the, the memory you pull out is one around the impact, the personal mm -hmm. impact, being able to see that tangible difference of, you know, yes, it's giving away a home, but to be able to see what it means to that individual, that family and that connection, that personal connection. I love that. That's the memory you pull out to highlight. Mm -hmm. And so carry that into, because these sort of questions around, you know, what difference am I making finding significance I've achieved at the highest level? What's next that leads you on a new journey. And so talk about the transition out of HGTV into what you're doing now, including your book. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was a huge crossroads. I think, you know, having been in television for well over 20 years, I sort of had, you know, reach the pinnacle. I couldn't go any higher up in the network. Um, I had a big staff. I, you know, had a lot of responsibility. I was at the point where I was enjoying, you know, all the perks of hanging out with talent and giving big presentations and, and doing all those things. And, but I was also burning the candle at both ends. I was flying all over the country. I had two young kids at home, great marriage you know, we were very active and involved in our community and our church. And I just felt like I had come to this place where I had checked all the boxes off. You know, I had done all the things that I thought I was supposed to do. I had, you know, had it all, you know, according to society, but was feeling restless, you know, feeling like I don't see any other boxes ahead of me to check off. I don't even know what those are supposed to be. I've crossed sort of that midlife, you know, 40s. And I don't feel like anybody's getting the best of me, including me. So 
what is the meaning? You know, what am I supposed to do? How do I find meaning in what I'm doing when I'm on autopilot? And I sort of feel like I'm wearing the golden handcuffs at this point, And it's not as exciting as it used to be for me. And maybe too, I saw people coming up behind me and thinking they would kill for my job. And I'm sitting here just kind of feeling restless and unsatisfied, you know, like unsatisfied. And is that even fair to somebody who really wants to sit in this chair as well? So I was wrestling through all sorts of emotions and, you know, had a million conversations with my husband and it didn't happen overnight. You know, I, we kept going back and forth on what we should do. And so, you know, ended up getting the courage up to resign, which my bosses weren't happy about. It was super scary, lots of tears, all the things. But I decided, you know, I needed the space to wrestle through these big questions, to take a break, to get some sleep, <laughs> to be with my children. And I just, I wanted to hit pause. And I I figured, you know what, if if the this whole idea is awful and horrible, you know, I'm just going to have faith that there's something else out there and I'll come out the other side, but I feel that it's the right time. And I feel like I can do this and not, you know, fall apart. And I think for me, you know, having a strong faith, understanding my identity wasn't in my job. It wasn't about what I did. It was who I am allowed me to leave because there's a lot of people in, in corporate America or in jobs that want to make a pivot, but their identity is so wrapped up in it that it's super scary. And it's not like I didn't feel naked once I walked away because I did, I was like, who am I? What am I doing? What's happening? You know, there was a lot of that. Um, but I felt centered and I felt like, you know, it's going to be okay. I just need to figure out what I want to do next and who I am and what's going to bring me fulfillment and how I can best use my gifts to impact the world around me. Let's dive into the book. And so once again, what if there's more finding significance beyond success? Give us a little bit of a synopsis on that book and, and really who it's designed for. So the book is kind of part memoir because it talks about my journey at HGTV. It talks about everything, you know, this, this arc of what we're talking about here of, you know, rising up and ex in what I experienced, but then hitting a crossroads and, and trying to figure out how to design the, the next chapter of my life. And it lays out a process in there that I do with my clients, you know, because I wanted everybody to have a taste of that and be able to kind of wrestle through these questions themselves. And so it introduces the process of strategic life map and really the power of understanding, you know, who you are, how you got to where you are today, you know, who you are today, which is different than who we were at 22. And what do we want for our future? What, what is the vision for our life? What's the legacy that we want to leave? And what is unique about me that I can bring to the world to help others? And so you do a lot of internal work, but then that internal work causes you to be external and start looking around at how you can impact others. And that's the beautiful transformation about it. And so when I talk about significance beyond success, what I want people to feel is that you can enjoy success. I think there's great things about, you know, having finances and you can do great, wonderful things with your money. Um, and then there's also nothing wrong with having a platform or fame or power or title. It's when you're only driven by those things that your life starts to take the wrong turn. And so what I want people to be is significantly successful, to have that success, but have significance just pouring through it, you know, that they they know that they can have an impact and be successful at the same time, because I think there's nothing more fulfilling than that, where you're appreciated and rewarded for your work, but your all your work is also going forward, you know, and you're like, you're saying impacting, you're a change maker, you're really leaning in to your little slice of the world around you, you know, no matter how big or small that is, you know, you can touch lives, you can impact people through your work, you just need to know how, and you need to have a plan, because you can't just you know, think of this as like a great idea. Like this all sounds good to probably everybody who's listening to us right now, but if you don't have a plan, you don't put pen to paper, it's not going to come to fruition for you. And that leads us in when you talk about navigate the journey, 
to what you're doing and even online classes that we'll tie in here in a second. And I think in many cases, when you talk about the self-reflection and understanding what fuels you and, and the mm-hmm. significance, you know, that you're trying to create and um, you're only as good as the, the answers are only as good as the questions you ask, yes. the better yes. way to phrase that. And so, you know, part of it is asking really good questions to get to know yourself better yes. and the significance you're trying to achieve. Right. And so yes. talk about some of those questions, because it's not just like, all right, surface one, two, three. It's like, right. nah, you got to get like really deep into this. And so talk about some of those difficult questions. Yeah. Well, you know, we have to go backwards before we can go forward. So we ask a lot of questions about what, how'd you get to where you are today? And I, my master's in psychology. So I tend to lean kind of deep into like psychological exercises. And, and the interesting thing about Navigate the Journey is, you know, we're a business consulting firm. Ultimately, you know, we help companies scale and grow. And, and my husband's side of the business, he's like the master, you know, strategic planner. And we realize like the, how we're helping companies scale and grow these tools that we're using mission vision you know value core values strategic goals you know coming back to those every 90 days really running your company like a well-oiled machine you know those tools are the same tools we can apply to our lives and so what we also found is interacting with all of these business owners and leadership teams we see that that they especially small business owners where they they want more than just the company. They want they want personal impact and they want the company to have impact. And so all of it just was intertwined and it just, this part of our company, Strategic Life Map, just so naturally evolved as something we were both so excited about because my husband does, it, does one-on-one sessions as well is really helping people to use these traditional, you know, tried and true business techniques and tools marry them to these psychology kind of techniques and tools to ask deep questions about why do I exist? You know, what are my unique gifts and talents? What am I passionate about? What are my personal core values? You know, what are the patterns that keep tripping me up that I need to reframe? What is the vision I have for my future? Who do I want to be 25 years from now? What's the legacy that I want to leave for myself? And, and, assuming, you know, that I can paint that vision for myself. How am I going to get there? What's the plan to get there? Because I want to make that happen. I don't want to wake up at 75 and be like, what just happened? Who am I? What just happened? Did I do anything that really feels impactful? You know, I, I want people to live in a present and intentional way where they feel their impact and they might not feel it every day, but they know they're headed in the right direction. And so that's what the process gives them, you know, really a clear picture of how they can find meaning and purpose through their work. Yeah. And I think time flies by so fast and it's so easy to get caught in the weeds, especially as a small to medium sized business owner, executive, whatever. You're just, you know, you're putting out fires, you're blocking and tackling. You're so busy working in the business every single day to your point, to step back and to realize, wait a second, what's the bigger picture? What's the bigger difference that we're trying to make so that there's fulfillment? Mm -hmm. And if you don't make that the priority to carve out and be intentional to create the clear picture and the plan, then all of a sudden you look back and you're like, well, where have these years gone by and what difference did I make? So I think everything you're talking about is so important in terms of the prioritization and the intentionality behind creating this plan to create your legacy. And so carry that into online and some of the uh, newer opportunities to get involved. Yeah. So we have an online course for strategic life map. I've been doing it, you know, one-on-one with people for years. And I, I take people through the online curriculum as well. One-on-one is an option, but we have a, a new group cohort that's launching. We just recently wrapped our spring cohort. We have a fall cohort that people can sign up for. It's online, you know, course, it's online materials and modules, but it's a lot of interaction with me. There's live group coaching that's involved and, you know, people that are at these same, you know, crossroads where they want to live intentionally, they want to create a plan for the next chapter of their life. They want to know that they're 
doing the right work in the right place, finding meaning through that work. So we do a lot of, of focus around meaningful work and, and how to create that meaningful work. And what should you be doing? Should you stay where you are? Should you go somewhere else? Should you make a leap of faith? All of those things. And we answer all these big questions. And so it's, it's really powerful. The last group that went through was a mix of, you know, entrepreneurs, business owners, business leaders. We had, a, you know, a couple of stay-at-home moms that had left the workforce and now we're trying to get back in and figure out what they want to do. And, and we were all sad to say goodbye to each other at the end of it, but it's six, six weeks long. If anybody who's listening to this is interested, they can go to um, my Instagram, which is Tracy, T-R-A-C-I, S Barrett, and just, you know, DM me, follow me, and then DM me City Current. You would DM me City Current, and I'll send you a discount code so that you can get it even cheaper. So <laughs> there you go. Love that. Yeah. yeah. So when you're doing this work, is you're pouring into so many others and helping them navigate the journey and find fulfillment, what's an aha moment or something that you and your husband have learned in this process that's made you stronger, either personally, professionally, or as an organization? Yeah, you know, it's funny because my husband and I, we just geek out on this stuff, you know, whether it's strategic planning or entrepreneurship or a strategic life map. And so we're always pushing each other. Like, are you, you know, what's the why behind what you're doing? Are you reaching your goals? You know, is this really what you want to do? And we kind of keep each other on track. And I think, you know, our aha moment, because, you know, he had a big corporate career for a while and then pivoted and, um, and then now we're doing this together is that, you know, we always, I always thought like maybe the pinnacle of my success was HGTV. And now this is just kind of like, you know, okay, this is the next chapter, but I'm realizing that, that what the work I'm doing now is just so fulfilling and so meaningful that it's really the pinnacle of significance that I was looking for. And, you know, I think we just feel like you know, God is just using us in the way that we should be used and that we're just sort of like vessels now, you know, like kind of that paying it forward, you know, we're in our fifties, we're really feeling like we're at this stage where we want to be the wind beneath other people's wings. And I don't think either one of us thought that was going to be fulfilling, but it's so fulfilling. That's a really interesting, you know, thought too, just because I think it goes back to being tied up with your titles, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you physically view like the arc of, well, I'm rising up because my title and my pay and all these things and I'm up here and then I have to start and I'm back down here and, you know, I have to create something bigger and better to, to beat, you know, what was over here. And it's like, yeah, that's not really it. Like it, it, that's, it's, it's not this, you know, arc up and down as it is, like you're saying, it all rises around and it's it's around significance and how many lives and at what level are you actually making a difference? So while you may have had a big title over here, you know, impressive and what you're doing over here, your level of deep engagement and transformation in lives, your, your ability to connect at a much deeper level is now way higher over here. And yeah. so I think that's where in many cases we get caught in these, you know, titles and things. And it's like, you have to remove all that because it really boils down to what are people going to say about you when you're gone? Yes. And if, if you're at a deep level with them, just like with your family, hopefully they're yeah. going to miss you, right? They're, they're going to miss you greatly. And it's like, that's the whole point is I would rather have one person miss me greatly than thousands not even know I was gone. Yes. I think that's the point that you're, you know, kind of touching on. And I think that's a very important distinction for everyone to make. And it goes back to leadership. You don't have to have a big title to make a difference. It goes back to the, you know, you don't have to make all the money and the, you know, be a billionaire to make a difference. It's all these things that we have to clear out of our mind as clutter to be able to free ourselves up to be true change makers. And so Let's carry this conversation into then a kind of a fun lightning round, and then we'll wrap up with some other uh, engagement opportunities to carry the conversation forward. But one, what do you like to do to relax? I love, you know, just being with my family. I, I just, we are super tight. We're in the last 24 months of having our kids in the house. And so we love to travel and we love to eat. <laughs> so we, the four of us are constantly adventure seeking. And so we like to hike. We like to, my husband's from Ireland. So we go overseas every year. 
and see his entire family still in Ireland. And so um, we have great connections overseas. And yeah, we just really love being together. And we love sitting on the back porch, having a glass of wine and talking about our days. There you go. So outside of Ireland, what's another family favorite vacation spot? Italy. Italy. My husband hates that. Sometimes I'll say, I wish you were from Italy and not Ireland (laughs) because it's like, I mean, I love Ireland. It can get a little cold and rainy, but the people there are incredible. I mean, the Irish people are just all about community and love and all of those things. But man, when you're sitting in Italy and it's warm and it's sunny and you're eating pasta and pizza, I mean, there's just nothing better. It's just, it's spectacular. It's our favorite place. Well, at least you, you, know, you kind of stick with the I theme, Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So um, for local, when you talk about people coming and visiting from out of town, where do you like to take them? What do you like to do? Well, you know, Nashville has changed so much in the food scene. And I think, you know, we like to go to the Ryman because I just feel like I have not been to another place that feels so intimate and feels so filled with history. And so we, no matter who's playing, we try to go there and take people to the Ryman and then just some fun spot in Germantown you know, to eat and, you know, just relax. And, and then also hiking, you know, we try to, you know, which isn't really in Nashville, but we'll go, you know, just a little bit outside Nashville and hike a waterfall or something like that, which was something when we had friends in Chicago, we, we weren't hiking waterfalls. So, so that's, it's unique and fun. And we love the nature that is around here. It's just so beautiful. So when you're writing the book, are you one of those that will stay up late and write or wake up early? Where where are you more productive? What, what What's yeah. your preference? I would, I have to do it in the morning when my mind's really sharp and I would write and write for, I mean, I blocked off certain chunks of time and I would start in the right, as soon as kid, got the kids off to school and I would write and write to the point where I actually got carpal tunnel, which I'm having, you know, um, treatment for right now because I was not smart about the whole ergonomics setup and which I have now, but, um, it just poured out of me. I just really enjoyed the process of, of all of it. And I had been prepping and doing research for a number of years. So I had more than enough, but it was, yeah, it was fun. It was intense and hard, but fun. This one is more for for tennis players. Tennis players are notoriously like very superstitious, and so do, any any routines or you know things like suspicious, you know, like I've got to follow this routine, or you know what what sort of uh, thing kind of stands out if there are any. I didn't really have any routines besides I would walk outside and look up into the sky because I I knew I was going to be indoors for a number of hours. And I was like, I'm just going to like set the mind and the, so I would just go out in our backyard and like, look up in the sky and like, try to get the sun on my face for a certain amount of time. And that was sort of my ritual of like, okay, now I can begin. And that, and a, like a huge Starbucks iced tea. <laughs> Those were the two things that I had to have before I could begin. <laughs> What's a, a fun date night for you and your husband? Oh, we just either staying in and cooking and, and watching a documentary. We're like really like documentary geeks, really, when it comes to what we like to watch. Um, Or it's just going out. And like I said, going to the Ryman or going to a really fun new restaurant. And we love going with other couples too. Like I, there's nothing better than like grabbing another couple and just laughing and having fun and learning about their stories. So that tends to be one of the favorites for us. What's a favorite quote or saying that inspires you? You don't have to obviously get it correct, but you know, just in general, what's a favorite saying or, uh, you know, a quote that inspires you? Well, it's the quote that I have at the beginning of my book from Dolly Parton, because who doesn't love Dolly Parton? And I, I honestly feel this way because the woman is the same. She's the same always. And she's so optimistic, whether it was, you know, during her career, during COVID, during anything, she just always had this. And so I put, you know, the quote from her, which is, if you don't like the road, you're walking, pave a new one. And I think for me, that was, that summed up my crossroads, you know, is if, you know, the road served me well, like no, I have nothing but love for, and I had the most extraordinary 
career and gift in HGTV. But when you get to a point where the road doesn't feel right anymore, nobody's going to change it for you, but you. And so you have to take the bull by the horns and pave a new one. And so that is just a quote that has, it just has stuck in me. So I love it. You are creating your legacy every single day. You're helping so many others craft and create theirs as well. But many, many, many years from now, what do you hope people say about you and your legacy making a difference? Mm. I hope they just will say that, you know, Tracy was somebody who, who helped me realize my potential, who ignited my purpose and then supported me through that. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that people can DM you City Current, and so they can go on Instagram, follow you and DM you for discount codes. But talk about website, social media, where do we go to carry these conversations forward? Yeah. So you can go to navigatethejourney.com. If you want to learn more about the company, there's a whole page there that talks about strategic life map. If you're just interested in strategic life map, you can go to strategiclifemap.com. Very easy to remember. If you want to know more about me, tracyshubertbarrett.com. So very easy URLs to remember, um, but you'll find lots of information there. And you can always feel free to reach out to me directly. I love hearing people's stories and talking to them and seeing what their needs are. Well, Tracy, you are a wealth of information indeed. You are a change maker. We greatly appreciate everything you're doing to power the good. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It was so fun.